Choi, a young promising guy, goes for an interview at a large corporation. On the way, he contacts his fiance, who wishes him good luck. And then, suddenly, right before his eyes, a man crossing the street gets hit by a car and flies right under Choi's feet. The guy tries to help him, but the poor man dies in Choi's arms. This shocks Choi so much that he can't even answer basic questions during the interview. And naturally, he's turned down for the job. He spends the next seven years searching for work, working as a laborer, waiter, and taxi driver to pay off his debts while his friends gain experience and create families. He sends out thousands of resumes, goes to interviews, and believes he'll find a good job. But time passes, and nothing changes. One day, he goes for an interview at the same corporation as seven years ago. After reading his resume, listing various odd jobs, the manager notes the guy's persistence, numerous certificates, and licenses he's obtained. Choi leaves the interview hopeful, but then he's told that his investments have completely burned down. In a fit of despair, he rushes to the investor to confront him and ends up breaking his doors. The neighbors call the police, but it's too late. Choi voluntarily handed his money to a scammer. Distraught, he walks to his fiancé's house and sees her being dropped off by a man in a luxurious car. She notices Choi and offers him money for the time being. Upset, Choi asks his fiancé to forget him, as she shouldn't tie her life to such a failure, and he goes home. He finds all his belongings at the doorstep, as the apartment owner evicted him for non-payment. In the morning, he receives a message rejecting him from the job at the corporation. This finally drives Choi insane. He climbs to the rooftop, realizing that his life went awry on the day the man hit by the car died in his arms. Choi is no longer afraid of death. He takes a step forward and falls. And on the ledge, his phone rings, displaying his mother's name. Choi regains consciousness in darkness. Confused, he removes the blindfold and finds himself in a chair inside an airplane. An unknown face is displayed in the monitor. Suddenly, a girl appears, reading his last note. She announces is that he's dead, but strongly disagrees that death is a way to end the pain. She transports Choi to a place where she intends to show him real suffering. They find themselves on a tall tower, with cries coming from below. She is the goddess of death, and intends to punish him for insulting death. With those words, the girl throws Choi down, and he falls into a horde of horrifying creatures in a sea of blood. He screams, fights off monsters, and he's back in the airplane cabin, facing the goddess of death. Choi learns that as punishment, he must die 12 times in different people's bodies. If he wants to avoid hell, he must try to survive in at least one of the given lives. Choi tries to object, but death disappears. The plane's engine starts shaking, and a terrified Choi puts on a life jacket, despite the flight attendant explaining that it's just turbulence. Soon, everything stabilizes. Choi looks around the plane's cabin and marvels at the expensive items. Then, a an unfamiliar glowing object appears before him, containing memories and skills of the person whose body he now inhabits. Choi finds himself in the body of the second son of the owner of the corporation, where he was so eager to get a job. The guy realizes he can continue his life with all this wealth and agrees to live on. However, the plane's engine <laughs> explodes. Choi manages to reach his seat and fastens his seatbelt as the flight attendant is carried away into a gap. The plane explodes and Choi dies in the flames. But immediately, he's reborn in a vast dark space, facing a glowing door leading to hell. Death sits at a table, loading a gun with bullets that will kill him each time, allowing him to transfer to another body. The glowing stone he saw will provide him with memories and abilities of the person whose body he enters. Choi doesn't understand and the rules of this game. How can he survive if all the other deaths are just as inexorable? But Death believes it's his problem now. If he doesn't survive, he'll end up in the hell she intends to show him. Choi sees a burning space filled with cries and pain, and cries himself for not understanding his guilt. And then, Death confesses. His guilt is that he arrived at death before she came to him, but he still has a chance not to go to hell. Death shoots, and Choi finds himself falling from a great height as a man. At first, he pleads for help, but then the glowing stone appears, and Choi realizes his new body is that of an extreme sportsman, agreed to make a parachuteless jump into a specially made net, televised worldwide. If he succeeds, the sponsor will pay him a huge sum. The glowing object penetrates 
penetrates Choi Ooh. and endows him <laughs> with the abilities of an athlete. The guy is confident that he can do it all. However, he crashes right in front of the net, shocking viewers worldwide. Choi finds himself on the brink of hell once again. He's outraged. He didn't have the slightest chance to survive. Then the guy starts recounting that he was born into a poor family, couldn't find a job, and lost his fiance. He had nothing to hold on to. Death mocks his enumerated problems and shoots him in the head. Choi finds himself in the body of a teenager this time. He then sees one of his classmates watching a video of the crashed athlete and laughing at his death. A glowing stone appears, and Choi learns that he lives with his mother because his father died. The woman works hard to support her son, but he hates school because the class leader bullies him. And one day, after another beating, he decided to jump from the roof. And that's when Choi enters his body. Choi realizes that if he survives, he won't go to hell and can start over. But the class leader immediately reminds him to bring him some milk. He needs some milk. An indignant Choi grabs a chair and attacks the leader to teach him a lesson. But the leader's friends come to his aid. One of them, a tall, strong guy, beats up Choi, and no one comes to his rescue. During classes, Choi reflects on his situation and concludes that he first needs to gain the support of the strong guy. He returns home and, looking at the poor apartment, remembers his mother. He also grew up in poverty with a single mother, who is now completely alone. Having dinner with another mother, he sees his own and cries from the pain of loss. In the evening, he receives a message demanding money from the class leader, who constantly bullies Choi. The next day, Choi meets with the strong guy, and he explains that the class leader is friends with the strongest 11th grader, and he allows his henchmen to do whatever they want. During lunch, the leader again bullies Choi, and in front of the whole school, Choi pours noodles over his head. Shocked by such audacity, the leader orders the strong guy to catch Choi, but he suddenly refuses because he doesn't want to miss lunch. Realizing that no one is going to protect the leader, the others laugh at the now former leader. The strong guy remembers how Choi asked him not to interfere with what's about to happen. The former leader rushes to the 11th grader, who leads his gang to settle the matter. But upon seeing who his help was needed against, he's puzzled. Can't a schoolboy handle a little classmate on his own? Then why is he in his gang? The embarrassed former leader tries to attack Choi, but the strong guy steps in. The power of the foolish schoolboy has come to an end, and even his girlfriend prefers someone else now. Choi starts running to get stronger, because he needs to be strong. And then, one evening, the former leader attacks him and kills him with a stone. Choi wakes up again on the brink of hell. He gets shot in the forehead and is reborn in a new body. He finds himself tied to a chair with a sack over his head. They torture him with water and then remove the bag, demanding to know where the girl and the money are. And when a hammer is raised above him, a glowing stone appears. Choi learns that he's in the body of a hitman. He once fell in love with the boss's girl, who asked him to help her escape. He hid the girl and the 10 billion won he stole from the boss and put in a secure place. But he got caught by the boss. And now, the guy breaks free and attacks the thugs himself. He manages to turn off the lights and defeat the gang. Choi decides to find the stolen money, which he will use to start a new life. He opens the door and finds himself in a moving truck. Choi gets out on a motorcycle while the chase ensues. They corner him on a bridge, where he uses all of his skills to escape, causing a massive accident. Choi races through the night city on his motorcycle, but the pursuit doesn't let up. Then, he enters a shopping mall, jumps into an elevator, and closes the doors before the pursuers can reach him. And when they finally catch up with him on the roof, he jumps straight into a pool. The boss orders to find the lucky guy. And he arrives at the pier, where a girl rushes into his arms. And when he tells her that the money is in the boat with lanterns, she shoots him. Choi finds himself at the gates of hell with a laughing death. But Choi is not so simple, because he didn't reveal the exact location of the money. In the next life, he hopes to find it. The guy dies and ends up in a prison cell. His friends warn him to behave well, or the murderer, a psychopath, will finish him off just four days before his release. Then, the psychopath enters the cell, and Choi recognizes him as the class leader who bullied classmates. Unable to contain himself, Choi attacks him. Other 
other inmates drag him away, and then a glowing stone appears. Choi's new body is that of a guy who dreamed of becoming an MMA fighter, but his mother got into debt, and the guy agreed to commit a crime for someone else's money. The fighter was still a minor, so he got a suspended sentence for running over a pedestrian. However, during the trial, the victim died, and the guy received a real two-year sentence. When the real culprit's lawyer came to him, the fighter threatened to expose him and demanded more money, and now Choi is trying to get the schoolboy to admit that he's not a scary psycho murderer, but a pathetic teenage killer. The inmates, outraged by such lies, beat up the murderer. One day, during work in the workshop, a tragic accident occurs. While the guards take away the injured, the others arm themselves, and stating that Choi won't leave the prison alive, attack him. But the future champion of MMA scatters the attackers. At night, he catches the schoolboy making a shank, and to punish him, he pretends to see dead people. And now, the victim of the schoolboy is standing behind him, saying that he will forever haunt his killer. The former, very gullible class leader experiences a mental breakdown. The day of release arrives. Choi meets the lawyer of the real culprit, who brings him additional money. But suddenly, the guy refuses them because he intends to live on from now on. Later, he goes to the pier and finds the 10 billion won hidden by his past self. He brings them to a rented apartment and makes plans for the future. At night, he dreams of his mother and wakes up in tears. And then, he receives a call from the mother of his new body. Choi promises to come. He divides the money into two parts, preparing one for the new mother, and hides the other in a storage room at the station. Choi goes to the area where the fighter lived. He is attacked by a man with a knife, and Choi doesn't understand who who wounded him. The man reminds him that he ran over his daughter with a car. The guy apologizes and confesses that another person committed the hit and run, and he took the blame for the money. The perplexed man stops when footsteps are heard and flees. It turns out that Choi's prison buddy caught up with him, but suddenly he confesses that he went to prison to kill the fighter and is now glad to have found him first because there is a reward for his head. The guy stabs Choi, who dies, regretting the money and the phone rings, displaying the name of the mother. Choi finds himself before death again, but this time he cries. Remembering his mother, death is disappointed with his new failure, and he asks to be shot. In the next life, he finds himself in the body of a young guy not far from the train station. Choi runs to the storage room and manages to retrieve the bag with the money at the very last moment. Then he sees a guy on a poster, and the appearing stone informs that the guy works as a model. Choi goes home and admires the expensive furniture. Then a a call comes in, and a friend of the model reminds him of a party. Choi goes to the party and realizes that he can't handle alcohol because he gets drunk quick. Suddenly, the CEO of the corporation where he tried to get a job several times at appears, and Choi tries to get to know him, but then he completely indulges in the fun. He wakes up when his older brother wakes him up. It turns out they have a whole cafe to take care of, and when his brother leaves, Choi has to take responsibility for it. And on this day, he needs to work as a waiter. And then, at the cafe, enters his fiancée from his previous life, Ji Seul. The guy is completely speechless. He remembers how they met when the girl lost several pages of her first book, and he picked them up, and how he suggested they break up because he considered himself unworthy of her. And now, a new meeting. Choi's brother, noticing his awkwardness, informs him that the girl is a famous writer. Choi immediately Googles and learns that the girl's novel recently won a contest Test. It was dedicated to her favorite guy. Choi remembers the night before he jumped from the roof. Apparently, in that envelope was her prize money. Upset, the guy leaves to find the girl's book. As he reads it, he realizes that it was based on their shared experiences and events. He told her that no one would cherish her more than he did, and he promised never to let her go. Now, in the cafe, he remembers that he promised to give her a fountain pen after the publication of her book, because, according to her, every true writer should have one. That evening, he secretly bought the pen and asked for it to be engraved but he never gave it to her. Then, the man who he saw in front of her house that day approaches Jisoo, but now he is with his family and calls the girl his sister. Choi realizes his mistake. The next day, he meets the girl with her favorite tea and asks for permission to tell her the idea of a new book. He tells the story of a person experiencing a series of deaths. The girl is amazed because he narrates everything so realistically. She asks for the hero's name, but instead, Choi asks for her 
her autograph, and suddenly he sees the same pen in the girl's hands, which, it turns out, was given to her by Choi's mother. From that day on, he meets with her daily and told her what his supposed hero was going through. The girl was astonished because everything sounded so realistic, as if he were talking about a real person. One day, he gave the girl a red umbrella because it was raining outside. He returned to the cafe where a waitress broke a glass, and he helped her clean up the shards and cut his hand. Then, police sirens sounded in the distance, and the girls who entered the cafe began talking about the accident victim. Choi rushed to the scene of the tragedy and saw the broken, red umbrella. He started shouting when he saw Jisoo standing across the street. The girl saw all of this and stayed to bandage his hand and talk. She understood that the guy was scared for someone dear. After all, she behaved the same way when she learned about her beloved's death. As a farewell, she says that she won't come anymore because his stories reminded her of her loss. Later, she goes to Choi's burial place and cries in front of his photograph, and Choi himself watches this from the sidelines. After waiting for the girl to leave, he approaches the shelf with urns, where Choi's mother finds him. He hears her crying and cries himself, trying to beg for forgiveness. Later, he writes a letter to Choi's mother, supposedly from Choi's friend, and puts it in the bag with the money, then gives it to the woman. The next day, he meets Jisoo and tells her the continuation of his story. She finds it amazing and she allows him to accompany her home. On the way, she hopes that his story will end well, because she feels sorry for the main character. He remembers how once she introduced him to her colleagues, not caring that he was a waiter, as she considered him hardworking and handsome. She meant everything to him, but he never told her that. He thought she would cope with his death, and now he wants to apologize for not understanding her properly, and admits that he will only ever love her. He blames himself for not realizing that there are people around who will cry and laugh with him in moments of disappointment and joy. He understands that nothing can be changed, but everything he told her happened to him. He got into this body by the will of the goddess of death, and he calls himself by his real name, Choi. But then, a car runs into them. With fading eyesight, he sees the director of the same corporation stepping out of the car, who is upset with a broken bumper, and he remembers that in their lives, he had encountered this man more than once. It was he who was responsible for the airplane crash, eliminating his brother as a competitor in that way, and for running over the girl. And now, he calmly kills Choi. Later, the police and doctors remove the consequences of the accident, and Choi comes to his senses on the brink of hell, and promises to himself to destroy the scoundrel. And then, he grabs a gun and shoots the goddess of death. An amazing idea, excellent special effects, and a very deep meaning. And not in vain, according to many film critics, this series has become a real breakthrough in Korean cinema. Friends, I highly recommend watching it. At the moment, only four episodes have been released, and I'm eagerly awaiting the continuation.